Hello students, welcome to chapter five in Buddy. Let's first review some notes in chapter four. So in chapter four, the setting took place in Little T's home and at school. Little T did get Buddy. He's learning how to take care of Buddy. Tanya tries to get involved in the care of Buddy. Jay boy is acting quite distant and strange at school. Little T writes Jamila a letter to tell her that he got the dog. And of course, his plan worked out. It all worked out, I say. What worked out? My plan. I got a dog. So as a review, you know that the dog is at the vet and they had to amputate the leg. And now Buddy is at home. He lives in the shed in the backyard and he's recovering but eventually we do need buddy to stand up and begin to walk again and we're going to find out what happens with this in chapter five is buddy going to recover just be patient Buddy, Chapter 5. But I ain't happy because Buddy ain't happy. And it don't seem like anything I do makes him happy. When Daddy gets home from work that night, he comes around back and he has a look at the sign nailed up on the shed. And at Buddy laying there on the blanket. And at me sitting there rubbing Buddy's side. Has he moved yet? He asks. And I shake my head. Then he goes to sit on the front porch with Grandpa T. And they drink a beer. Mama comes out and tells me I need to come inside and do my homework. I say, I'm busy with Buddy. She says, when Jamila was here, she can count on me to get it done before dark. I say, she can count on me by myself now. And besides, I don't have any. And Mama says, Humph, and looks down at Buddy. That dog's fur looks like a rat's nest, she says, and then goes back inside. I rub Buddy's head all up under his collar, and he don't move, not even the tip of his tail. I tell him stories until he's asleep. Then I go to sit out front with Grandpa T and Daddy. I highlighted, I tell him stories until he's asleep, just to show you how Buddy has become Little T's friend and Little T likes to talk to Buddy and comfort Buddy. Everybody's outside taking in the cool of the evening and talking back and forth from their phones. They're talking about work and ball games and how those boys down the street finally crossed the line and got what they deserved. And whether Brother James is going to preach one of those empty your pocket sermons again for old lady Jenkins who just broke her hip. And then one of the neighbors sings out, Hey, little T, where is that ugly old three-legged dog? And everybody laughs like it's funny or something. Wow, Mama calls Buddy a rat's nest. And the neighbors are saying, where's that ugly old three-legged dog? I wonder how little T is feeling about all this. The next day when I get home from school, I get an old brush out of the bottom drawer in the bathroom and I go to work on him. He lays real still and I start at his head. I can't get that fur around his caterpillar scar to lay straight. But the fur on his neck lays down softer and softer the more I brush it. I work the brush up under the collar a little and Buddy stretches back his head so I can get way up under his chin. You like that? 
I say, and I swear he smiles. Up under his stomach, some little wads of fur are still hanging on. I get Mama's sewing scissors and start cutting them out. You see, Little T is grooming the dog. He's learning how to trim the hair and brush the hair, you know, perhaps eventually bathe him. So Little T is learning. Buddy half sits up and tries to watch. You can't see with that collar, I say. And anyway, you got to lay down. He eases back down and I start brushing again. He's watching my face and I'm talking to him. You think I'm crazy, I'm saying, giving a dog a haircut, brushing him with a hairbrush. When I run that brush over his sides, I feel the ribs bumpity bump and Buddy's eyes start drooping shut. You've got to eat up, Buddy, I say. We've got to make you fat. You've got to get strong. Then I start to brush near his cutoff leg and he lifts his head up sharp and makes a low sound deep in his throat. I stop right there. Did you growl at me? I just sit there for a minute and look at him. He looks right back like he knows he's crippled now and it hurts and he feels like a fool with that great big collar going around his head. Then he lays his head back down and I reach out to rub his nose, but he turns his face away. I go back to brushing his neck. I don't know what else to do. That's all right, I say. We can just wait on that. There ain't no hurry. You ain't heading for a beauty contest. Well, that's a good thing. I turn around and there's Grandpa T standing in the doorway again. He sure ain't winning a beauty contest. He's ugly as sin. He's beautiful, Grandpa T. You're just blind. Maybe, Grandpa T says and eases on in, but could be you're too crazy in love to see how ugly he is. Buddy don't think I'm crazy. He's glad he's living here with somebody who'll brush his fur and fill up his bowl. I don't tell Grandpa T, but I'm sure that's true. <laughs> Grandpa T, I say, why do you think he won't stand up? He's only got three legs, you fool, Grandpa T says. What would you do if you only had one? But the vet says he ought to be getting up any day. Grandpa T squats down by Buddy. Buddy moves his head just barely enough to see Grandpa T. He don't bother to lift it up. Grandpa T lays his hand on the top of Buddy's head and stretches Buddy's eyes way open. That caterpillar eyebrow wiggles up Buddy's forehead and Buddy looks straight up at Grandpa T. His eyes are so dark, so brown, so soft looking. Grandpa T lets go and the eyebrow slides back down. Buddy closes his eyes again and I swear he heaves a sigh. I think he likes you, I say. He likes anybody who would be nice to him, Grandpa T says, and rubs his finger on the caterpillar scar. He's lucky he ain't blind. What do you think he thinks, I say? Waking up and there ain't no lake where there used to be one? Grandpa T shrugs, like, oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you think he's scared? Are you scared, buddy? Grandpa T says, almost like he's talking to baby Terrell. Buddy opens his eyes. What are you scared of? Grandpa T says, you've got little T now. You've got this fancy shed to live in. You're laying on one of my old blankets. Buddy lifts up his head. You're ugly as sin. 
Grandpa T goes on. You're ugly as sin and you stink. Oh, poor Buddy. And poor little T, right? <laughs> Buddy's ears are standing up. His mouth pops open. He starts going, <laughs> Why don't you stand up, dog? Grandpa T says. Come on, get up. Buddy's tail is swishing back and forth on the floor. He looks from Grandpa T to me and back again. Grandpa T stands up. Come on, get up. Buddy raises himself up on his front feet. Ain't it time, Grandpa T says. Ain't you strong enough? Buddy's whining and whimpering. <laughs> his mouth looks like he's trying to smile, but he can't quite do it. Come on, dog. Grandpa T is moving toward the door. Don't you want to see what's going on out here? Buddy stretches his feet out like he's trying to drag himself to Grandpa T. Woof, Buddy says. Woof, woof. Come on, Buddy. Come on, boy. Grandpa T is standing at the door. He's holding one hand out to Buddy and waving the other one out the door. And then Buddy lets out a little moaning sound. And he lays back down and he turns his head toward the wall and he rests his nose on his paws. So Buddy couldn't quite do it yet, right students? Not yet. When we take him to the vet for his checkup, the vet says his cut has pretty much healed. And he takes off that collar. I'm standing there rubbing Buddy's neck feeling all the way down to the skin where that old collar has been wrapped around him. Buddy is half sitting up with his tongue hanging out of his mouth and looking like he remembers everything about this place, especially that old cage and how he woke up without one of his legs. Then the vet asks how he's doing about getting around. I can't even look at the vet. He ain't stood up yet, I say. Not at all, the vet says. Not where I saw him. The vet gives Buddy a hard look. He feels all around under Buddy's belly. Buddy gives him a look, like if he does that too much more, Buddy just might take out a little piece of his hand. Then the vet gives him a little bump on the behind and says, there's nothing wrong with him. It's time for him to get up, even if you have to force him. When we get home, Daddy says, this is the last time he's carrying Buddy. He puts him down on the blanket and leaves out. Buddy lays there like he ain't never going to move again. What's wrong, Buddy? I say. Why ain't you happy here? And Grandpa T is standing there in the door and looking in. He's old, Grandpa T says. Maybe he's just too tired. Maybe he's been knocked down so many times, he just ain't got the heart to get up anymore. So you're saying he wants to die? Oh, no, he's a dog. He don't want to die. I'm just saying maybe he's too tired to live. Look at his eyes. You ever seen any eyes look tireder than that? I look at Buddy's eyes. They look big and sad and tired. But they don't look that tired. Grandpa T, I say, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. That's the craziest, stupidest, wrongest, dumbest thing I ever heard in my entire life. Probably so, Grandpa T says. Ain't the first time I said something dumb. He gives Buddy a good hard look, then looks at me. Your mom is cooking red beans, he says. Don't stay out here too long. Then he turns around and heads on inside. He's crazy, ain't he, Buddy? 
He's crazy and stupid and dumb. I'm rubbing the place that collar used to be. Buddy's laying still as a stone and breathing soft and low. Right, Buddy, I say. But Buddy, don't say nothing. Hmm. I'm wondering if Buddy is perhaps feeling a little depressed because, you know, the collar is off and he can see and he's realizing that he's missing a lake. And even though he's probably happy to have food and live in a shed and have little tea, I, I think the dog is realizing um, that he's missing a lake. And I don't know, maybe he's missing his previous life or his previous owner or wherever he came from. Let's look at chapter five notes. So the setting was, you know, Buddy's shed, Little T's home, and the vet's office, and then back in Little T's home. And here are the important parts of the plot. Family members make negative comments on Buddy's appearance, right? Little T grooms Buddy. He learns how to brush him and trim his hair. Grandpa T talks to Buddy. You know, he also tries to get Buddy to stand up. Grandpa T is trying to help out, right? The vet takes Buddy's collar off. And at the end, we learn that Buddy appears to be unhappy and tired. Now, remember we spoke about conflict, and conflict is a problem in the story. And this internal and external conflict, well, in this chapter, there's external conflict. It happens outside of a character. It's between two characters or a force of nature. Just think of an exit sign, external, it's outside. At the beginning of the chapter, Mama wants Little T inside the house to do his homework and chores. But Little T wants to be with Buddy in the shed. And that's a conflict between Little T and his mother. And they'll continue to have that type of conflict throughout the book, where Little T will just want to spend more time with Buddy. Grandpa and Little T, well, they want Buddy to be happy and to stand up. But Buddy remains sad, and he won't stand up. So it's a conflict that Grandpa T and Little T have with Buddy. Here's the stop and drive. The vet says there is no reason why Buddy should not be standing up and getting around. Explain why you think Buddy isn't trying to move. And I don't want you just to say, oh, because he's depressed. I want you to think of... Um, a number of reasons why you think Buddy isn't at least trying to move. Okay. All right, students, this was great. I hope you're enjoying the book and the narration. And um, I'll meet you next for chapter six, where Tanya has a dream that, well, let's just put it this way. It's going to change the course of events in this story. Okay, have a great day. Don't forget to do the stop and jock question and turn it in. Bye.